So another critical assumption in uh, hypothesis testing and these statistical tests is independence. All right, so so all or nearly all statistical tests have some assumption of complete independence or at least some kind of independence. And the definition of independence can get a little tricky, but generally speaking, it's a good enough working definition is if knowing one data point helps you predict another data point more than just the mean of the data points, then the uh, the data points are not independent, right? So, so the biggest example is subjects, right? So if you take data repeatedly from the same subject, those data points aren't independent, right? Because, you know, let's say we've got two subjects and we take three data points from each. Well, we know that all of the data points from the same subject, these are going to be close together and these data, these data points are all going to be close together. Right, so we so the, the data is not independent. Those six data points are not independent. Three of them are related and the other three are related. So, you know, for example, that's what I sort of say here. If you want to know how a drug works, so you give placebo to person A for 100 days and the drug to person B for 100 days and you sample, you know, every day, get 100 data points from person A and 100 data points from person B, those data points are not independent data points. Or maybe you want to know if a new form of lecture increases marks. So you give one university class the new form and then you keep another class on the old form, right? Again, because you're repeatedly sampling from the same class over and over, these data points are not independent. Or if you want to know if roundabouts are safer than light controlled intersections, so you count the number of car crashes at a whole bunch of roundabouts from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then you measure the number of crashes at lights from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m., right? The, the, some of those data points are all going to be related because they're all taken at the same time. Um, and, you know, independence is often related to experimental design, right? So, so the, you know, we think about it as, as an experimental design problem. Um, but it gets a bit more complicated than that. But the problem is that a lack of independence can lead to an over or an underestimation of the population variance, so how variable the data truly is, an over or an underestimation of the mean of the population, and an inflation of the degrees of freedom of the statistic, right? So, you know, to put that more simply, you know, if I, if I did that test where I had two people and I took 100 measurements from one and 100 from the other, is in... 200 because I took 200 recordings or is in really two okay so as I say you know independence is often an experimental design issue right you know you can think about how some of those experiments were designed and you would never act sort of on purpose design them that way but you'd be surprised how often it does kind of creep in um, and then there are times when it sort of is a good thing so a, a classical version of this is the repeated measures design so we get 50 subjects before a drug treatment and after a drug treatment, right? So the, so we don't really have 100 independent data points because we've got 50 subjects and we measure them before or after. But that might be good because we have, we're really just interested in the change before they were treated and after they were treated. Or perhaps you follow 10 university classes before and after the adoption of a new type of lecture, right? Again, we're following the same subjects, so it's a repeated measures design. We're repeatedly measuring from, from the subjects. Or you count the number of crashes at five roundabouts and five light-controlled intersections every hour from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Okay, so we're repeatedly sampling from those five roundabouts. So we don't really have a whole collection of completely independent data points. We somehow have, have less than that. Um, now, unfortunately, there is no simple statistical test for lack of independence, right? The computer cannot tell whether your data points are independent or not. You need to be aware of it. You need to think about it. However, for simple before and after experiments, um, a paired t-test uh, deals with this lack of independence, right? Because we, I think I mentioned this, a paired t-test is actually just a one sample t-test of the difference between the before and the after measurement. And so because of that, our p 
paired of independent, sorry, of non-independent data sets, our before and after get turned into a single data set, and that gets rid of the um, lack of independence. And there are some other ways of dealing with the lack of independence. In fact, you know, repeated measures designs are so common and come with such useful features that there's a whole statistical field called mixed effects models, which I typically wouldn't want to get into at this level, but it's so useful and so common that I think we're going to have to talk about it. So the mixed effects model assumes that everything you're measuring is a mix of sort of two signals. The fixed effect, which is the same for every subject and is typically like your treatment or your, your whatever you're doing to them, and then some random effect, which is different for every subject. That's why it's a mixed effect, it's a, because the outcome is a sum of the fixed and the random effects. The fixed effects models also know how to deal with this degrees of freedom problem, you know, which I talked about before, that if you if you sample two people 100 times each, is n equals 2 or is n equals 100? And the, the mixed effects model tries its best to, to deal with that. And so let's sort of just show why these models are useful, right? So let's say we've got a, a drug that we think is going to be a pain killing drug all right and so we give it to people and these are the data sets we get do you believe from this data set that the drug works well if we just do a t-test we get p equals 0 0.03 all right so under the assumption that these are all independent data points i.e we have about 10 people 10 or it's probably nine one two three one two yeah so nine and nine so we've got 18 people 18 people were tested in the placebo, sorry, nine people were tested in the placebo condition and another nine people were tested in the drug condition. We get P equals 0 0.03. Uh, not convincing, right? But what if I told you that data set actually was like this, that we actually had three people, each one tested three times in a um, placebo condition and a drug condition, right? So now these data points are not independent, these groups of six. What about now? Do you think the drug works? Well, I'm pretty convinced the drug works. You can see that the the response goes down quite a lot in every single subject. We do a mixed effects model, and now we get p equals 0 0.0009. So a pretty convincing um, result. Okay, and you know, again, you can see the problem. What is n here? Is n three because there were three people? Is it nine because we tested? nine times is it 18 because there are 18 total um samples or is it somewhere in between and the answer is actually it's somewhere in between here's another one right so this is the ham d score the hamilton depression score we've got some drug that we think is an antidepressant here is our data points which i'm guessing is sort of 20 in the control group 20 in the drug group does it look like the drug works right well again if this was truly 40 independent data points, 20 people in the control condition, 20 people in the drug condition, we would get P equals 0 0.0000006. But what if it was this? We have four people, each with sort of 10 data points. Well, here you can see it's kind of, it's even just a meaningless, you know, what if, what if Drove naturally had a low depression score, you know, you can't tell from this information really. Um, but if we do feed this data into the mixed effects model, it tells us that P equals 0 0.03. And certainly, you know, nobody, you'd need to have many, many, many more subjects to really take anything meaningful from, from the, that kind of experimental design. So mixed effect models work because each subject is given their own coefficient right when we think about the you know how linear models work how they are the sum of some coefficient times some input well here each subject is given their own coefficient which helps explain the variation due to the subject however the coefficient given to each subject in each group in each condition must add up to zero right so what that means is that the coefficient for, for by and che 
their coefficients must add up to zero and the coefficients for Druv and Eli must add up to zero. So this means that the coefficients that are given to the subject can't explain any of the variance due to the differing condition. So fundamentally what it's kind of like is that the, the computer pretends there's a mean sort of halfway between each subject, uh, but not quite, right? It, um, and as I've said, you know, the, the, the mix effect model deals with the um, complicated issues of degrees of freedom, right? And this, dis, the, this design here is N3 because of the three subject, or is it 18 because of the 18 different measurements? What about K, the number of coefficients? Is it is it six, one, two, three, four, five, six, or is it just two because of the placebo and the drug? Right? Again, the mixed effect model no does its best guess at trying to figure out what the appropriate degrees of freedom is.